I'm thrilled and delighted to welcome you to the Library of Congress National Book Festival and to our fourth annual Youth Poetry Slam. <laughs> um, this year we have uh, two, two uh, slammers from two teams who traveled quite long distances to compete. So I'm gonna announce them. Please join me in welcoming first from somewhat nearby Boston, Mass Leap. And from the other coast in Sacramento, the Sacramento area, Youth Speaks. These two teams made the final stage of the 2018 Brave New Voices International Youth Poetry Festival this last July. <laughs> and we are very happy to feature representatives from both. We are also thankful to Youth Speaks and to their new executive director, Christy Limon Johnson, they're the organization behind the festival uh, for their help in bringing final stages teams and poets to the slam. Uh, I'm sorry to say that the slammers from Do More Poetry, the 2018 Brave New Voices slam champions from nearby Baltimore, were scheduled to be here tonight, but unfortunately had to cancel. But we do want to honor them and their, their championship team, so we have a video from this year's performance that we'd like to show. Fatherhood left my mother pregnant with absence. Breastfed me broken promises. My father knows the neck of liquor bottles better than he knows my name. My father loves his spirits just like he loves being one in my life. But now, poetry has been the best father since the biological one left. Having an addict for a father and a soldier for a mother, the war on drugs will happen on my homeland. While she shot up people, he shot up himself, and I'm the one left for dead. Having a coffin for a mother and a criminal for a sperm donor. You learn to live outside the box. You become so numb, like a robot. But how do you explain to the world that you have a barely functioning motherboard? And, and then, then poetry came and raised me from my broken home. Words became magical. Maybe that's why they call it spelling. Through this American horror story, we coveted our pain. But poetry taught us to drop houses on our sorrows. Meaning, we used to live in our depression. Now we fight it. Boxed out my black out for the title champion. All the times he told me I wasn't man enough. Blame the women in my life for my female traits. He liked to talk with his fists, but got mad when I talk with my hands. Only appears to appease. Becomes a vanishing act when it's time to raise. Never taught me how to fight, so I got jumped. More times the amount of times I prayed for you to save me. Changed my praying hands into fists. Became my own guardian angel when you had no more to give. Dad, you are no savior. You just think you're God. That's why we can't see or hear you. And our family forces us to praise you. I remember when my mother died. I couldn't tell which was more cold. My mother's, my father's shoulder or my mother's body. I just didn't want to lose all this joy in the morning. But, and, and there's, there's always a but. Poetry taught me commas in place of periods. Taught me resilience in place of suicide. Taught me metaphors in place of self-mutilation. And isn't that what it means to be a father? When I slam, I'm not doing it for the points. I'm doing it for all the love. I remember when I wrote my depression poem. Four people told me I gave them the strength to finish theirs. I remember after me and Mecca performed our abortion poem. Our tears and smiles was all I needed. After having a life sucked out of me, only took three minutes to breathe it back in. Meaning, we, we were fatherless. But now, our poetry family raises us. If it takes a village, then I got that. Fatherhood left my mother pregnant with absence. Breastfed me broken promises. But what's a deadbeat dad? to a self-love poem.
Although we wish Baltimore was here with us, we are happy to have uh, our local SLAM team in our hometown pride. Uh, so as with every National Book Festival Youth Poetry Slam, we are excited to introduce the DC Youth Poetry Slam team members and the team. Please give it up for them. Uh, before I, I turn things over to our MC Joseph Green, who's done this Poetry Slam for the last three years, uh, I'd like to say a few words about our Slam partner, Split This Rock. It's hard to imagine where poetry across the country would be today without the organization. And of course, the organization would not exist without all the hard work of co-founder and executive director, Sarah Browning. After 10 incredible years, Sarah has decided it's time to turn the reins over to another leader as she goes off and studies poetry. Sarah, you have been a force of good in my life and in the lives of so many others, and you've wowed the Librarian of Congress too. She's hoping to make it here tonight to catch a little bit of the poetry slam. Uh, one of her first official acts as a Librarian of Congress was to come here and be a judge in uh, 2016. But uh, she did give me a little something to pass along to you. So if you could come up onto the stage. So Sarah, this is a, this is a rare hardcover copy of uh, American Journal, 50 Poems for Our Time. This is Tracy K. Smith's uh, anthology that is just coming out. Uh, part of her second term project signed by the librarian herself <laughs> with, with great love and affection. So thank you, Sarah. And now Joseph Green. Welcome. You expected it to be more exciting, I know. Welcome to the Library of Congress Youth Poetry Slam. I invite you to make some more noise. Do you feel like you made enough noise? <laughs> I don't feel like you made enough noise. Let me put that in perspective. Today, as you just witnessed, you are about to listen to some of the most powerful voices of a generation. Young people who have been given a space and a stage and a pen to write down a story that they already had, but we too often do not listen to, they're going to come up here and something miraculous is going to happen. You're going to feel connection without anybody touching you. There's going to be something profound going on in this room. I uh, was raised in the South um, during the summer times and I would go to church with my grandma and they would say, um, better than I can say because I can't sing, are you ready for a miracle? And the church would say back, ready as I can be. Are you ready for a miracle? Ready as I can be. Library of Congress, Youth Poetry Slam, make some noise! <laughs> okay. It feels better. It feels better. It feels better. Welcome. My name is Joseph Green, and I will be your host this evening. Um, I have a co-host who will be sitting over here. She is the Director of Youth Programs at Split This Rock. Her name is Chelsea. Everyone give Chelsea a round of applause. We'll be talking back, to, back and forth as the slam goes. Chelsea, say what's up to everybody. What's up, everybody? Just like that. You can feel the connection, right? We've been practicing. Um, the five minutes before the show. We just decided to do this. It's going to be crazy. Um, 
things that you guys need to know about. Uh, this program, as you heard, was brought to you not only by the Library of Congress, but by Split This Rock. Uh, and a couple of things that you need to know about Split This Rock. Their mission is to cultivate, teach, and celebrate poetry that bears witness to injustice and provokes change. Now, I'm going to say that again because it sounds like I just read off a bunch of words, but I want you to really listen to what they do and what is behind what we're doing here today. Split This Rock's mission is to cultivate teach and celebrate poetry that bears witness to injustice and provokes change. I think that you all can agree there are some injustices and we need to provoke some change. They do a lot of things that Split This Rock along with their youth programs. And as the evening goes by, I will tell you more about what they do. Now I'm gonna tell you why we're here. Uh, show of hands, you've ever been to a poetry slam before? Oh, okay, good. Show of hands if you've never been to a poetry slam. Oh, that's gorgeous. All right, awesome. Uh, people who have been to a poetry slam, say what's up to the people who ain't never been to a poetry slam. What's up? What's good? How you doing? Nice to have you here. This is what's gonna happen today. We have six amazing performers who are gonna get up here and share an original piece of writing that they wrote themselves, all right? There will be no musical accompaniment, uh, there will be no props, uh, and because this is at the National Book Festival sponsored by, brought to you by the Library of Congress, uh, the first poem that each one of the young people reads has to be about books or reading or learning something in that space. And then the second poem can be about whatever they want it to be about. So you're gonna hear two rounds, that's 12 poems, P prepare yourselves, it's going to be amazing, okay? Now, at a poetry slam, it is a competition, right? So, I know, right, competition, boo, competition, but it's fun, it's America. This is what we do, all right? We take an art form and we deep fry it and we bring it to the world. And so, it sounds like I'm throwing shade, but I like fried chicken, so. Um, the fun part about what we do is, we have some judges here that will be scoring these poems from zero to 10. Zero being the most magnificent, excuse me. <laughs> zero being, it's been a while since I posted a slam. Zero being, uh, a, a, we'll call it a bad poem, right? I don't know, I don't know if you want, how you call a poem bad, but we'll just say that that poem probably shouldn't have made it to stage today. I'm pretty much guaranteeing you 195%, ain't no zero poems gonna make it to the stage today. Now then there's a 10. 10 is simultaneous, profound lifting of spirit of every member of this audience to another realm of space and time understanding. Same time, those are commercials where the little heads pop and like the little blue smoke comes up. That happens when the 10 goes. You'll feel it, it's a metaphor, but you'll feel it. All right, now would you like to meet these magnificent judges who have volunteered their time here today? All right. Now, when I say their name in the midst of their bio, you're gonna wanna make noise. Let me finish the bio for the people, like the eight people in the audience who don't know who they are, all right? National Poetry Slam winner Elizabeth Acevedo lives in Washington, D.C. What I, what I say? Lives in Washington, D.C. Her poetry collections are Beast Girl and Other Myths and Medusa Reads Negra's Palm. Her new book, The Poet X, from Harper Teen, is a New York Times bestseller. A novel written in verse, Acevedo has a BA from George Washington University and an MFA from the University of Maryland. She is a Cave Canem Fellow and has participated in the Callaloo Creative Writing Workshop. Please make some noise for Elizabeth Acevedo! Natalie E. Illum is a poet, disability activist, and singer living in Washington, D.C. She's a 2017 Jenny McKean Moore Poetry Fellow and a recipient of the 2017 Artist Grant for the D.C. Arts Commission, as well as a nonfiction editor of the Deaf Poets Society Literary Journal. She was a founding board member of Mother Tongue, a woman's open mic that lasted 15 years. If you've ever been to an open mic, the one that lasts for 15 years is a great open mic. 
She used to compete on the National Poetry Slam circuit and was the 2013 Beltway Grand Slam champion. Uh, she has been published many times and she's been on NPR Snap Judgment. Please make some noise for Natalie E. Ellum! And your last judge, Javier Zamora, was born in La Herradura, Herradera. We'll work on it afterwards. Know that I said it wrong and I didn't mean to. El Salvador in 1990. At the age of nine, he migrated to the United States to be reunited with his parents. Zamora holds a BA from the University of California, Berkeley. Yes, California, Berkeley where he studied and taught in June Jordan's poetry for the people. And yeah, well, if you don't know, you should know. Look it up. Um, and an MFA from New York University. He is the author of Unaccompanied. Please give all of your love and energy to our three judges, including Javier Zamora. Right. We know what a slam is. We know who our judges are. There are a couple of things that I need to tell you about how to participate in this moment, okay? So this slam is not a presentation, it is a conversation. So when these poets perform, you need to give them your energy back, right? In the form of a response. That response comes in a few ways. One of the ways is snap. Can I get everyone in the audience to snap? Whew. Beautiful, the largest bowl of Rice Krispies in the world. <laughs> so hungry, okay. The second thing you can do, you can say, you can say word. word. On the count of three, I'm gonna need you to say word with your chest. One, two, three. Word. I appreciate you. You can make that sound you make when you have a delicious piece of chocolate. Mm. Don't eat chocolate. Uh, I don't know who you are, but if you don't eat chocolate, think mango. Mmm, I feel like it got less people, that's weird. I love mango and chocolate, but I'm just crazy. All right, last but not least, you can do what is my favorite way of showing appreciation. Uh, you can take the word she, you can take the word Jesus, and if you hear something that makes you feel particularly holy, no matter your religious denomination, you smush those words together and it becomes Jesus. <laughs> now, what I'm about to do will be a litmus for how much fun and passion and enjoyment we're gonna get out of this event this evening. I'm going to ask you on the count of three, everyone in this room to put your right hand up and give me your best Jesus, all right? From zero to 100%, we're gonna tell how, how it's gonna go down here, all right? On the count of three, it's better when you participate. I'm bracing myself. One, two, three. Jesus, oh! I don't know when you're gonna have the opportunity to be in front of a thousand people you don't know um, and have them say the word Jesus right hand up to you, but if you ever get that opportunity, you should pursue it re relentlessly. Are you ready for a poetry slam? Say word. word. You are not ready for a poetry slam. And I'll tell you why not. Because before we have a poetry slam, we must have a poet come to the stage and calibrate our judges because they're rusty, they ain't, it's been a year since we've been here, right? We gotta make sure that they're ready for this because this is real serious. So we bring what we call a sacrificial poet up to the stage. And she performs. Oh, I gave it away. They perform. And then we get the scores and then we start the slam. I need y'all, like you are clapping for your firstborn child <laughs> that just won a spelling bee in a language you did not know they could speak. <laughs> I need you to start clapping right now for Carlin Newhouse!
Dear Marvel, after your installment of Black Panther, may I suggest a follow-up movie, a sequel, if you will. The movie will be about a superhero magic black chick. We can call her Super Black Girl or Afro Woman, yeah, Afro Woman. Drape her cape in royal purple because she is a queen. Crown of kinky curls bestowed upon her, let her rock Afro puffs or box braids, and let the movie's theme music be gospel hymn meets Kendrick Lamar. She can be played by Viola Davis or Taraji P or any other black woman because aren't we all magic in our own way? Aren't we superheroes? Watch as we give birth to a world full of brown folks. Watch as white folk tremble at this gentle giant we call a black woman. Ain't a black woman, all soul food and tsunami and sweet incense smoke. Watch as we make the moon magic out of dust. Watch as we turn our tears into an ocean, into a well for him to drink from. Watch as we give all parts of ourselves and do not disappear. But we do know black women disappear. Easy left no trace like evaporated incense smoke. Ain't that proof that a black woman is magic? That we feed the world and are then abracadabra away? Can't we at least have a Marvel movie? Or a day we don't fear our children dying in front of us? So give us a movie, Marvel, and let it be called Afro Woman. The movie supervillain can be the personification of white supremacy, or Becky with the good hair, or an evil clone played by Rachel Dolezal. Afro woman's powers include reversing a bullet, giving birth to a revolution and invisibility. Also, hypervisibility. The metaphor being that black women are always ignored or exploited. Her invisibility powers are in a set of Bengal bracelets. The metaphor being that black women can be heard, but not seen, like screams or ghosts or gunshots. And when Afro woman defeats the villain, because she will defeat the villain. For once, she will be the hero. For once, she will not take second place to something white or masculine. For once, the black woman wins. And at the end of the movie, I want a scene where she marches down the street, all Bantu knots and combat boots, and a million black women march behind her. The metaphor being that behind every great black woman is a thousand other great black women. The street ahead is dark and unknown. Afro woman shines all the light in the galaxy. And this will not be a metaphor or an explanation for anything. After all, we all know black women are magic. Okay. 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 Y'all ready? I want to make sure that you're ready because you might hear some things this evening that might contrast your worldview. You might hear some things this evening that make you question or wonder. You might hear some things this evening that make you want to learn more. You might hear some things this evening you completely disagree with. But that's why we're here. We're here to grow and build community, to celebrate voices that are not celebrated on a regular basis, and to make space for all the voices because this stage and this world and this, and, and this, this literature, this, this, this spoken word, these poems that we do has room for all of us, a vision of all of us. So I hope that you're ready because I, I, get, I, get, I get tired and then I'm like, oh man, I could, I'm, I'm sleepy, da, 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 da. And then I hear the first poem and then I remember why I'm here again. So I just wanted to make sure that all of you were in the same space that I was. Also, judges, that's the longest amount of time I'm ever going to give you to do your scores. Chelsea, are we ready with the first set of scores? Yes, sir. Speak to them. From low to high, we have an 8.3, an 8.3, and a 9.2. Clap it up for the poet. (laughs) 
So I forgot one important thing. I'd like to thank uh, my very vocal team of, of, of supporters here in the front row for reminding me. Uh, if you hear a score that you do not appreciate, we don't boo here in this space. We say listen to the poem because obviously the judges didn't hear what we heard. Right, so we want to make sure that they are recalibrated and ready for the next poem. So let's practice. The best poem you have ever heard before gets a 4.4. You say, Listen to the poem. and then I say, clap for the poet, and then you, hey! We have teams today representing the You Speak Sacramento, the DC You Slam team, and Mass Leap. Can we please clap for all of those teams? That will be the last time I mention the cities until the show is over. And now I think we're ready for a poetry slam. Chelsea, we ready for a poetry slam? Yes, we are. We are ready for a poetry slam. Coming up first to the stage, please put your hands together for Kenny! So, uh, in class, in my U.S. history class, I started writing in the margins of my textbook. You know? Like, during class. It'd be, it'd be right next to all those purposeful misprints, you know? The, the glorified mistakes until eventually, my teacher came and told me to stop writing on my textbook, you know, because it's not mine to claim. And I think she knows, like, the stories told through the faded ink on the pages that I never owned a piece of this, you see. This history was not written for me. It sings the star-spangled banner to some, but all I hear is a rebel yell. And all I see are pages ready to flip onto my skin like embers. All I see are dead white men I'm supposed to mold into gods because half the time, this class is arts and crafts. And we practice putting red, white, and blue construction paper over anything that doesn't look like it belongs in this Western scene. In this country touched by God, or the wrath of God, you see, it's all about perspective. And perspective has always been the footnote pressing my head to the floor. Concept attempting to tear open my skull, because kids have strived to be open-minded, or as open as they want, as open as these textbooks can go. And we were never supposed to test the limits of this binding. I constantly feel my knowledge press against the walls of this curriculum, amazed with narrow passages, every page a bob-wired sentence, and I am made heathen for believing that there's something on the other side. You know, for learning things that can't fit between the pages of a book or into square ma minds like, like, dang. Like, like, like how the U.S. led a genocide on the indigenous people of this land. Cool. Um, and how it still sanctions such slaughter, so... Why do we have to glorify your forefathers in this home of the slave, land for the free? It's funny how they teach white kids about conquering, but teach kids of color about confinement. And I'm reminded the space for people of color in American history has always been in the margins. So, one of the things about being the host of a poetry slam is that you're not allowed to speak about the poems because it, you know, could sway the judges or the audience. So, I have the ability to think some of the people who made this happen and also tell you about Split This Rock and some of the amazing things that happened there. I'm gonna start by thanking some folks real quick. If you look to my left over here, you see that we have ASL interpreters here in this building, right? Can we please give them a round of applause as we attempt to make this accessible to all judges, 
rather. Sorry, I got to get used to our new format. Hey, Chelsea, what's up? Hey. Hey, you got some scores? I do. Read them scores out. All right, from lowest to high, we have a 7.9, an 8.2, and an 8.3. But we're going to clap for the poet, right? <laughs> Keep that energy going for the second poet, Keisha! All the way to the stage. Keep that energy going until she gets to the stage. This the sack, this the sack I see. This the sack, this the sack I be. This the black, this the black I be. This the black I free. In 1865, the 13th Amendment was written to abolish slavery and indenture servitude. So why do I still feel these chains? So why do I still feel these chains? Thurgood Marshall did all this work for us to go from physical chains to mental chains, and now I'm wondering when my people gonna ever be free. Stripping these black boys from their families, stripping these black girls from their worth. See, um, they tell me to go to school so I could get a degree for profit, profit such as wealth, money, and maybe fame, but without all that profit, I'm just black, and what's the profit of that? This the sack, this the sack I see, this the black, this the black I free. In my school, majority is black and Mexican. Repetition of learning the same history. They gentrify my school and hood, repetition of taking our identity. Chained up in these uniforms, like this professional dress is gonna paint me white. But I won't let them change my mental. They call our school a charter, so they're allowing them to kick out our people. Can't step foot in my homeschool or the boot I get into prison we go. And this the sack, this the sack I see, this the black, this the black I free. Kids are blinded by kids getting accepted to UCs, forgetting that we're not accepted in real life. Kids dropping out of UC, so clearly these classes that are required aren't helping us in real life. I remember when education was actually meant to educate and uplift the youth and help us elevate, but now all it seems like is a dollar in their pocket. Now all it seems like is a dollar in their pocket. So I remember when slaves were, uh, slaves were allowed to read or write, but now we're placed in these classrooms and forced to learn things and it seems like brainwashing to me. Schools are the new prisons. Classrooms are the new plantations. Incarceration is the new slavery. Why are we afraid of police are supposedly protectors? Why are, do kids hate a place that is supposed to lead us to success? Why, why, why? Am I asking enough questions for you? Are you woke yet? When I walk in these classroom doors, stop pretending like I'm not expected to fail and end up in jail or hell. Stop pretending like these A's are going to save me. When I walk out these school doors like my life isn't at stake, like my skin color is not a threat to society, like I'm not playing survival of the fittest, praying that I make it home safe. Superintendent. Why is this school system sending all my friends to prison? Thank you. So, uh, I realized I didn't really introduce myself. I'm the former director of youth programs at Split This Rock. Yeah, things you did in the past. Woo! Um, but it's my pleasure to be able to tell you some of the amazing things that they are still doing at Split This Rock. So, 
They have, in their youth programs, they have after-school clubs in 10 high schools in the D.C. metropolitan area. They have the D.C. Youth Slam team, which represents D.C. every year uh, at the Brave New Voices competition. We also have two after, excuse me, we have two giant festivals that happen every year. One is called the Hyper Bowl. This happens at George Mason University, where we invite about 200 young people from up and down the East Coast together to do social justice workshops and poetry slams. It's amazing. They also win a scholarship, $1,000 to go to school. That's amazing. You're welcome. Also, we have Louder Than the Bomb that we do in... LTAB in collaboration with the Kennedy Center. I tell you all of this not because I expect you to remember it, but because I expect you to be intrigued by it. I expect you to say, I wonder what else they do. And I expect you to go to their website at splitthisrock.org and check out all of the amazing programs that they have there. Chelsea, are you ready to tell them what the scores were? Been ready. <laughs> What'd you say? Do you say you've been ready? Okay, cool. Um, Go ahead. I'm going to do it now. From low to high, we have a 7.8, a 7.9, and an 8.3. Can we clap for the poet, please? Coming up next to the stage, the third poet in the first round, Marjan! Woman holy enough to be marketed for marriage. 16 years old, a feisty one loves to correct. Can be lighter if bleached. Last name Nodiri, belongs to the royal family of Jamial ad Din. 100 pounds, five foot, green eyes. Can sell her silky hair for almost as much as sheep skin. Cleans up your past, smart, despite bereft of education. Cooks the dead flesh of the female corpses you fail to sell. Seasons them with propaganda faith. Serves them on a plate made of gold that you've mined from your mother's heart. Father taught me to never ask for a higher dowry. If I could speak, I wouldn't ask why. I would ask where. You learn to sow secrecy into our scarves, burn submission into our burkas, keep us blind until our bodies go from human to animal to extinct. Where did you learn to be the smoke from a burning fire that our tears can't extinguish? Women become the ash without having ever been cold, without having ever seen the light in our lives, without having ever seen warmth, only becoming the darkness. The wedding is the auction. The sell-off becomes the funeral. The price tag, my eulogy. Father taught me to never wear my heart on my sleeve, but rather in my hands so I could crush my heart before you get the chance to. Shh, don't think too loud. Remember, the opposite of marriage is death. The price of speaking is flesh, unless you crave the black and blue being bruised onto bones. I heard if you throw a woman into a steel corset wedding dress, her rib cage will crack and you'll never hear her scream. Now look, isn't this wedding ring pretty? Now look, isn't this wedding ring pretty? Admire the sleeves of henna wrapped around my wrists. Watch these blossoms turn to cuts because the pain of a woman has always been such a beautiful thing to you. Middle Eastern in fighter, Middle Eastern in strength, strength. But when did adding woman to Middle Eastern mean less of a survivor of war? of rape, of womanhood. I guess father never realized that a woman must shine bright before she is ash, must bring warmth to all cold hearts. Woman holy enough, 16 years old, a feisty one, loves to correct, will set off a fire, watch me set off a bonfire. Smart, despite bereft of education, the paradox of our eyes are that they burn last in a fire. So the rest of the body melts while you watch it happening. Watch me stir up a revolution, peeling the shells of the patriarchy Patriarchy, mixing your ego, insecurity, drowning them in the oil that I cook in. Watch misogyny burn between the bonfire. Watch womanhood rise above your body's ashes.
You know what y'all should do? If you're having a good time, if you're being inspired, if you're being moved, you should go ahead and find Split This Rock youth programs online at DC Youth Slam on all the social medias because they put up clips, they do writing prompts, they tell you about all of these amazing events that are happening around town. Every third Saturday they have an open mic at Bus Boys 5th and K. So if you have like a young person looking for a space to be or if you're a uh, person of older years and you just need to be inspired, you need to check out at DC Youth Slam on all the social medias, except for the ones that are like exclusive, like Snapchat, we don't do that yet. Um, but we're out there and there's amazing things happening. Chelsea, read them scores, please. From lowest to high, we have an 8.4, a 9.1, and a 9.5. Clap it up for the poet. Coming up next, we have anime. All the way to the stage, just keep that energy going. I've been experiencing writer's block, but not the kind when you can't write, but when you can't feel. Mm, come on, poet. When words fail to be seen and my tongue can assist me like it once did, often I wonder if this pen has lost all of its, cur all of its courage to keep writing, mm. but I carry my ancestors' bravery. Mm. So when I get writer's block, I find inspiration in dancing trees ponding my release from my chain mentality. And I realized that time is complacent, that surviving as a black artist with anxiety can be a suicide mission. Some days I feel my body being swallowed up into the belly of white supremacy, where I am dead weight and oceans full of bodies floating, refusing to become ebony. See, that's how I be. Too afraid to swim so I become a wade in the water too worried to be too worried and being misunderstood, so I become statuesque. Mm. See, I was forsaken by the same hands that birthed me, so mm. poetry is more than sustaining a legacy but creating a family. Mm. Come on. You see, writing is surviving, it is allowing each metaphor to drip off the tongue. Can you taste it? Mm. Let it be the taste of bravery. For I don't just write to live, I write to give. Finding a peace of mind by sharing this peace of mind. Thank you. Wow. So, Split This Rock also has adult programs, right? Some would say it started as adult programs. It started as this amazing festival that happens every two years, right? If you wanna know more about the adult programming, the writing workshop that they have every first and third Wednesday, you can go to the back of the room and you can wave at those beautiful people back there. Wave, we have uh, Stephanie and Malik in the back. Please go and visit them, sign up for their listserv, Every week they send you a new poem called the Poem of the Week, a social justice themed poem that will make your life better. And it's free. All you got to do is go back there and sign up on your way out. Please go and see all the amazing things they're doing. Um, more announcements to come. I'm ready to hear what the scores were. Scores from Chelsea. From low to high, we have an 8.4, an 8.4, and an 8.5. Clap it up for the poet, please. <laughs> We got two more poets in this first round. Please put your hands together for Mariama. A boy cut off my hair in the seventh grade and I still have yet to forgive myself. 
Jalen called me a weavy wonder in a class full of other black children, yet I still felt stranded. Wished my curls could spring into action, but felt all too trapped in a maze of braids where every turn was just another dead end to do anything. In high school, I've had boys run their fingers through my kinks and insist I ought to relax. Rough palms and lulled voice attempt to turn me from statue into a body of water, but black girls aren't supposed to get their hair wet anyways. I soon learned that my dark and lovely has never been creamed and not to fit anyone's standards. Wow. So what do you call it when your own people encourage you to colonize your roots? Wow. If hair had memory, a lineage of African women before me would do all they could not to drag you back to yours. They think, damn. No 4C could have foreseen this. How black girl gets told she has slave stained curls, so I drag them back to the Atlantic, where hair was as tightly packed as ancestors on slave ships, to a time when black bodies were being used as anchors and cultures and customs were the only things to keep us afloat. Here is where we learned liberation, and hair is what brought us our history. So you boys, with your spinning brushes and do-rags, y'all drown us in discomfort, but forget who put the motion in your ocean. Preach that black hair has been the way but act like your mama ain't got a head full of fuzz too. The same boys with beady beads and receding hairline condemn a sister for wearing chats but forget that there was a time when our hair gave y'all life. That runaways once dependent on the patterns etched onto my scalp. Them cornrows once lit up a path to freedom aided only by Harriet Tubman and the North Star. So believe me when I say legacy dangles from every log without us, would you know their way? Soon after, masters began cutting off the hair of their slaves, and this is what we considered to be the first big chop. It became clear that the conditions of our survival could be seen through our roots, but some days, I question if this hair has ever truly been ours, because white people have been picking at our locks like in 1979, when both Derek wore cornrows for the first time, and soon after, many other white women copy the style. Before this, they call our hair kinky, call it nappy, call it dirty, dreadful, and unkept, but never beautiful, or mine, how even now, Kylie's out here trying to hold a candle to my roots, but this hair was made to filter heat so its edges laid and pressed it still. Don't think I'm bringing fire to your neck. The next time y'all want to talk about good hair, just remember a tender head wasn't going to pave the way to civil rights and what magic. How even trinket serves as the perfect metaphor for this blackness, how we black women can stretch a little into going a long way. I want to tell them that black hair was once a mother's prayer. That history, pride, and pain weaves themselves into my cornrows every night. I tie my scarf like, don't y'all know? Black women have been wearing bonnets since bondage and whipping our hair since masks have been cracking whips since then. My crown has been nothing but tight fists and curls. It's learned how to put up a fight has been bobbing and weaving self-hate and heat for as long as I can remember. Now my naps stay woke. My curls too popping to be pressed, but Jalen, Maybe I should still fade you. How y'all feeling? Make some noise if you've heard something that's inspired you today so far. All right. Let's put some numbers to that inspiration. Chelsea. From low to high, we have an 8.8, .8, an 8.8, .8, and a 9.5. Let's clap it up for the poets, please. Woo! Ba -ba 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 -ba. Last poet in the first round, put all your energy and love together for Kofi! After Janae Johnson. So this kid in my chemistry class called me a nigger so frequently you'd have thought he had forgotten my name. I never thought that my tongue would betray me the way it had others. I sat there, looked his bigotry square in the face. I saw my rage clench its fists. 
So I set destruction to his surface like mortar shells. I made bruises on his skin so black that it looked like a degentrified Brooklyn. See, maybe I shouldn't have snapped. See, maybe his jaw wouldn't have if I didn't. See, I hit him with water hoses drowning out the sounds. Hit him with nightsticks in my knuckles. I hit him with every apology I've ever made to this skin. For every time nigger made a crater in my pride, I let it sting his like a whip. I could have sworn I heard no master come out his lips, but I did not stop. I hit him for every time the slur slipped out. Serenading him with the sweet tin music. I taught myself to play. This boy, this boy would never call me a nigger again. I had won. But this didn't happen. I let a white boy call me outside my name and I didn't fight him out of fear. Or better said, out of necessity. Because of the way my mother reminds me of my surroundings, I see myself in the muzzling my angry. She says suburbia will suffocate her son. Doesn't know the blunt smoke did that already and ain't a blunt rap the perfect metaphor for my blackness. Always being cracked open, contents being spilled out to make room for something new to be consumed. To dissipate when they are done with me, I thought that if I let it go, he would leave me alone. Knew that if I struck him, it would morph in the baton that would break my back. So I sat there and I laughed, a big, hard laugh. Chill with that. Left my lips as uneasily as it ever had as my rage rattled its cage. Sat there in its cuffs, screamed at the top of its lungs and added to the tally another day it's been made to lie inside of me. I hope it knows I'm sorry. I hope it knows it. I hope I know. I'm sorry. That's the end of the first round. How do you feel? I'm happy that we've come to the understanding that my expectation is for you to respond with sound. So we're good, right? And everyone was like, we're good. You know, you actually gave it back in the way I was looking for it. Um, Chelsea, are we ready with those scores? We are ready. Let's go. From low to high, we have a 9.0, a 9.1, and a 9.1. There we go. There we go. There we go. So as I said, that was the end of the first round. We're gonna run it back in the opposite order, but before we do that, um, I would like to introduce myself in a way that doesn't include something that I just did, but more you know, specifically what I am doing. Um, yes, my name is Joseph uh, Green. You can find me online at lmsvoice.com. I am a motivational speaker. I'm an educational consultant, writing curriculum, visiting schools, um, and I'm a professional spoken word artist also. So. You can check me out on my website or you can follow me at Joseph LMS, the letters LMS, like like my status, like, uh, yes, like my status, yes. Uh, LMS Green, Joseph LMS Green. Um, I also am doing this so that the person who just went last has a couple of seconds to breathe before we go back again. Um, yeah, let them breathe, right? Because y'all been doing work up here. I say y'all, I'm looking at y'all as in like the youth have been doing work up here. Um, Chelsea, is there anything you want to share with the crowd? I know I'm putting you on the spot right now, but I thought, you know, you've been in the job now for a month. Is there a reflection you would like to share back to the people or something you would like to tell them? A reflection. Yeah, so. <laughs> I really appreciate all that you did at Split This Rock. Oh, thank you, Chelsea. I appreciate all that you're doing at Split This Rock now. Let's clap it up for Chelsea, the new director of youth programs at Split This Rock. Are you ready for the second round? Then let's start by bringing up the poet you just clapped for. Coming first, Kofi! Back, back, back again. Clap all that energy all the way to the stage.
You don't know how little you matter until you're all alone. The product of a broken home and the recycled story it came with. My mom tells me I don't take care of myself. And like she's right. <laughs> there be days when rage be the only tongue I can call my own. Days where I can't remember the last embrace of my father. Self-care is a language I'm still learning. Now my life isn't a scratching record. Men to repeat the same tired tune I find myself trapped in, but I'm a man whose masculinity is as fragile as the ego I built it on. That must mean that my casket is a scratch ceiling. My masculinity is a bad religion. Brought me to my knees and asked me why I fell in the first place, meaning I gave it my devotion and it hung me from the same cross I thought would bring me salvation. My resurrection won't be as triumphant as the one on the third day, but it'll be me waking up to the second verse of Pink Matter. I learned it all from Frank Ocean. Learned you take as much time as you need to become who you need to be. We all grow at our own pace. It might take four plus years to drop the damn album, but <laughs> we'll get there. I read his open letter. Saw how coming out cleansed his spirit. I saw his bare bones and the potency of his penmanship. It almost sounded like me. Now, I couldn't truly resonate with the story. Our experiences be different, but I've always longed for that same catharsis because I never had that. I've always been taught I was the man of the house, you know? Taught to take care of everyone and then myself. You try not to show the broken, so you learn to numb the pain. Novocaine did it best, the Frank Ocean song. Not actual Novocaine, where was I? Something about numbing pain and how my fists numbed every time I acquainted them with the walls. I get lost in the thrill of it all. I let it linger, it's the only way I've ever remembered that I am my father's son. It's the only sliver of manhood I ever learned from him. See, the men in my family don't really get it like that, but Frank does. See, the men in my family are children of the sun with obsidian hearts, meaning they're black and beautiful and cold and hard to crack. I ain't never seen my father cry. Only seen my brother cry once. I ain't cried since death made my grandfather past tense. Frank Ocean has that project, right? Boys don't cry. But I'm learning that tears tear away the turmoil of any trauma, and because of that, I'm making peace with my soul. Because of that, I'm praying for peace of mind to rain from the sky like man. Now I guess what I'm trying to say is Frank Ocean taught me how to love myself. Taught me to take my time. Taught me that not being okay is okay because I never looked at myself as anything more than a burden. Always thought myself to be akin to Atlas, holding up the weight of the world on strained shoulders and scraped knees. I've reprised my desire to do it solo. But I'm learning to take care of myself in a way that won't worry my mom. Oh, while turning my casket scratch ceiling into an open door, I'm learning that this is a sweet life. That I'd rather chip my pride than lose my mind out here. It wasn't Frank Ocean that I thought would help me experience this epiphany, because in all honesty, I'm used to being closed off here. Yeah. Ain't used to being raw. Now you are, and I am madly involved, madly involved. Sometimes you just have to let it. Chelsea, you ready with the scores? Yes, sir. Awesome. From low to... Yeah, no, that's a good time. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we're going to work it out. We got five right. more to go. Okay. All right. All right, I'm going to go. Yes. Low to high. Got a 9.2, a 9.3, and a 9.4. Clap it up for the poet, please. <laughs> Coming up next... Mariama! Hey, yo, Boston. Yeah? Talk to him about a bathroom set up. Dirty. We pray that no harm on thy children may fall, that blessing and peace may descend on us all, so that we may serve thee ever alone, land that we love, our Sierra Leone, wow. for home. Africa produces three quarters of the world's diamonds, but not all come cut, cleaned, and polished into perfection. Some grow black spots we call graphite. 
They say the clarity of these stones depends on the size of their impurities, but the most prized diamonds are not usually found in poorer colors. The irony in this is that they are cultivated in a terrain as jagged as mountaintops, dug up by people with eyes like ivory and skin the color of obsidian, in a continent whose pain is often overlooked. It's safe to say that like these stones, my mother's land has been flawed since the beginning. When I think of home, my sweat slick chest becomes speckled with blood as hand turns to stump and white ulna sees sun. For the first time, I am a girl dripping with the history of a war-torn country, but my people don't bleed. Our diamonds do it for us. When the conflict ensued, my parents fled. So I can't tell you what it was like to have grown up there. So I've seen the severed hands or witnessed the limp, lifeless bodies. But even as an Akata, I can tell you a fear. I can tell you that the fear of being forgotten in a land made foreign to you scares us more than your Ebola viruses do. And all I have left to ask is to the employees of De Beers Diamond Mining Company, what do you have to say for yourselves when the well-being of a group of people can matter less to you than the amount of rough you're able to pocket? If Sierra Leone translates to Lion Mountains in Italian, then Pedro de Sintra, just how quickly are we to become the pride of a dying breed? Roars reduced to remnants and human beings turned beasts of no nation to Americans. Do you know what it's like to live in a country that loves you back? I'm both black and Muslim and learning more as the more in America that not all men were created equal if the death of one can outweigh that of another. If J Sheila Abdul Salam can show up dead in a river and have her passing be ruled a suicide. I stand as the fifth of six children of two third world immigrant parents who have never let me forget that words are sharper than swords. So as Sierra Leone stands as number 180 on the World Health Organization list of disparaged countries as I call my grandmother from the privileged end of a boss telephone car to speak for only 10 minutes and a savagery continues to run through the pinnacle of these veins in the Fra Bay community, I am reminded that this is not for the 32 karat wedding band sitting happily ever after on your finger. This is for the people suffering every day just so it can happen. This is for the jollof fries who taste so tantalizing it surpasses every other. But most of all, this is an elegy written for the people whose names I don't know but whose country I come from because this is for Sierra Leone and you trying to turn diamonds into dust but forgetting we are resilient. We got any writers in the audience? Show your hands, show your hands. Let's like show your hands type question. All right, cool. Anybody in the audience that ever thought that they might want to do like an open mic or perform in front of a group of people but they haven't done it yet? Just show hands. All right, cool, cool, cool. There are some spaces that you can go to to pursue that dream. I told you, as a young person, you can go every third Saturday, Fifth and K, Bus Boards and Poets, it's the youth open mic. But if you're an adult and you wanna do the same thing, we have a little event that happens every third Sunday, sponsored by Split This Rock and Bus Boards and Poets called Sunday Kinda Love. That happens at Bus Boards and Poets 14th and V. There's a community of people out there ready and wanting and willing and needing to embrace you and your art and your craft and your story. So please take these opportunities and join us because once you get up on this side of the microphone, it only gets better. Chelsea, you ready? Ready. Let's go. From low to high, we have a 9.0, a 9.1, and a 9.2. Clap it up for the poet, please. Coming back to the stage, the third poet in the second round, NMA! I think he forgot I was black. Like, I was too far from the unknown. Scientists call me an abnormality. Lacking too much vitamin D, that's why my skin looked this way, but he, with his light brown eyes and silver smile, told me I was too cute for a black girl. Like, he forgot 
My skin wasn't passed down by solid kings and beautiful queens like he forgot. My skin wasn't a symbol for the metal in my back, the sass in my hips, the ocean in my throat. This boy forgot I was forgotten letters sent by my father, stamped with the year 2000. He forgot I was a, sou a, a silver spoon scooped with chocolate kisses. He, he missed my black privilege to say I lived past my days of puberty. So I should not apologize for wearing this black hoodie on my black skin and shout to Trayvon Martin for dying from my sins of skin. Lost in the horizons of the sun, my skin. Lifted hands, swayed hips, and Afro baby blues, our skin. Baby, this kind of blackness runs through our veins. Roots so deep call us the tree of life. Call me black, call me oppression, call me obituary, call me quick. Call me insane, call me the black girl without a brain, but if you want me to be anything out of this range, then you can keep the change. Thank you. I keep having these moments where I think to myself, how cool is this? Right, that the Library of Congress, not only, you know, they do the National Book Festival, oh, that's amazing, but like every year, for the past four years, they've insisted and worked really hard with us. It's not easy putting this together, getting young people from all over the country together. Every year, for the last four years, they've invested time and money into this event right here. I just want to shout out the Library of Congress. Because we'd be in front of the, 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 the convention center doing a, a poetry circle without them right now. So, a cipher, thank you. I'm catching up. Chelsea. From low to high, we have an 8.6, an 8.7, an 8.8. .8. Clap it up for the poet, please. <laughs> so much paper, so little time. Now, the fourth poet in the second round, please put your hands together for Marjan. <laughs> All the energy. All the way to the stage. Come on, A letter to the baby I aborted. What was I supposed to do when you asked who Baba is? What would I do then? Would I tell you the only time I saw him, he reeked of cigarette buds lit out by moonshine? Threw $11 to my feet before abandoning this corpse on the edge of 17th Street. I miss you. Today, more than I missed you yesterday, what am I supposed to fill the empty space with? How am I supposed to empty your fragments twisted into lumps throughout my soul? The words I am are slowly becoming I was, slowly becoming we were. I've shattered my glass heart back into loneliness. Cut my fingers trying to jigsaw puzzle us back together. And what was I supposed to do? What if you had his eyes? What if every time I looked at you, I'd watch your eyes unearth all the wrong parts of me, unearth all the shoved screams from the basement of my belly, the puncturing pain piercing my body, remembering how he left every frozen muscle in me burning? What if you were the spinning image of your father? What if every time we locked eyes, I saw him? What if you had his smile? Every time we laugh, I hear his contempt echoing in the empty aches of my womb. And they say blood is thicker than water, but blood is never thicker than my feet is slaughtered. Why can't water flood the graveyard of my body, wash away the sins on your tombstone? And here I am, planning the funeral for a child that was never alive. Is this missing you or the emptiness you feel? Is this love or guilt? Only heard you sing in the soft hums of cold wind. Never heard your prayers. Only felt your hands slipping from the monkey bar of my ribcage. 
never fisting around mommy's finger. And every time I watch the sunset, I know what would have been your favorite color. And every time I see myself, I know what you were supposed to look like. You were supposed to have my smile. You were supposed to be the spitting image of your mother. Because you were going to teach me to love myself. Because I would have loved you. Chelsea, are you ready with the scores? From low to high, we have a 9.0, a 9.6, and a 9.7. Can we clap it up for the poet, please? Coming up next to the stage, please put your hands together for Quiche! together no more, but this is still my favorite Christmas. This year, I spent at daddy house. Mama bought me apple bottom jeans, and daddy bought me boots with the fur, so you know how I'm rocking it. <laughs> my stepbrother said he got a special present for me, and I, I just can't wait to see it. I really hate surprises, so I keep bugging. He told me don't worry because it's real big. My stepbrother's really the best. He took me to the back room. He gave me the biggest piece of candy, or I thought it was a piece of candy. I was scared, but who backs down to sweets? It's always just been me and my mom. I couldn't believe it when she said I couldn't go to my dad's anymore. Every time I came back from his house in the summer, I gained a little weight. I didn't know if it was because of the depression or all the candy. My father said she was just trying to keep me away from him, but I guess he never noticed my stepbrother's sweet tooth. I hated my mom. When in reality, she was just trying to protect me from all the sweets. But by the time the cavities came in, there wasn't really much she could do because Medi-Cal wouldn't cover it. The therapist wouldn't take our insurance. Nobody to help. My tooth began to decay, and it felt like I was rotting from inside to out, turning white to yellow to brown to black, and I'm still rotting. I always knew diabetes were genetic, but I never knew you could catch a disease from a sweet tooth. I'm the cutest 16-year-old you ever see. These dudes stay hitting me, but I don't want them because all they want to do is hit. I met this one dude, and I think I kind of like him, but every time he hugs me and his hands touch my waist, I begin to feel wasted like I, uh, like I forgot how to talk. Anyways. I'm hecka grown and I don't need a dude for nothing. I got all these girls hecka mad because their dude wants me, but my father just got out of jail and he swear he fathered the year, but where was he when I got cavities? Where was he to help pay to repair my sweet tooth? He tried to come in my life and raise me like I wasn't already grown. I got enough dudes, I don't need him. I be straight hustling. I got a dude who get my nails done, one who pay my phone bill, one who take me out, and of course one for pipe. Oh, and I work at the CVS Center. These customers, hella annoying. <clears throat> Hello, welcome to the CVS Center. How may I help you? I never thought I'd feel like this again. 
It's so hot in here. I'm starting to get anxiety. I, I, I can't breathe. Can they turn the air on? It's like, it's like the devil himself is standing in front of me, pulling me down to hell. I went on my break. I called my mama. I told her I saw my stepbrother, and he smiled at me. So every year, Split This Rock has a poetry contest. It's an opportunity where they open up uh, the contest to all members of the community. Uh, it is called the Sonia Sanchez Langston Hughes Poetry Contest. Let's put a little weight behind it. <laughs> right, we're not playing around. Got some good examples that we're looking to. This year, the poetry contest is open until November the 1st and is judged by Franny Choi. <laughs> so if you don't know who Franny Choi is, and you just heard these young people get really excited about it, do two things. One, look up Franny Choi, and two, go to splitthisrock.org and contribute your poetry to this poetry contest. First place winner, 500 bucks, and you get to spit your poem at the poetry festival. That's a big deal. Clap it up for poetry contest. As a means for us to share powerful, pieces of art and making the world a better place. Yeah, not just the contest. Chelsea, scores please. From low to high, we have an 8.9, a 9.0, and a 9.1. Clap it up for the poet. And this is it, we've made it to the last poet of the round. Put your hands together for Kenny! All the way back. Prom night 2017. Prom night 2017, I'm taking the lint from the inside of my pockets. And, and, and I'm taking the middle school snowstorm and I'm taking the squeak of my kicks through the hall. Yo, I'm taking the Dean's List, though I was never on it. And, and I'm taking the awards cabinet, though I was never in it. And I'm taking a bottle of Sprite and I'm gonna be caressing its curves like I'm halfway through an all-nighter with less than half of the necessary word count. I'm taking Blaziken, Obama Snow, and Piplup. Yes, I said Piplup. Pokey chat me when small talk is an HM, and I'll be there with every show I ever binge watch when I was supposed to be breaking down quadratic equations. I'm taking every hole in my book bag. I'm taking every hole in every pair of sneakers I've ever had. I have so many holes. <laughs> You'd have thought me by now an empty man. I, I fill my body up with my voice some days just to remind myself what I have left to hold on to. In prom night 2017, I arrive alone, fear lacing the inside of my collar. Standing like a last second decision waiting to shrink back into oblivion. But then I see my friends. And you'd have thought them lighthouses the way they wave, see. High school was a hurricane. And we were always caught standing outside. They still make me smile. Like this is just another Saturday night. And after the music ends, after we step back outside into the cool mouth of night, make peace with our toes stuffed inside these dress shoes, and our laughter, like a dandelion, finding the slivers of light, 
finding its way into every corner of every eye in us, a flock of smiles breaking fly for winter. Band of black beardless bandits, come to steal the star shine. Back room bootleg binge watchmen open our jackets like we trying to let the whole world inside our part. After the music ends, after the dance floor clears like a holiday tabletop, you find your forehead wet with whatever your footwork managed to kick up. The magic dissolves beneath the house lights. The doors open and let all that stank out. We step up, come from out the cut again, and this is our part. Plays like PlayStation and School Bell and Anime and Awkward. And awkward silences, and however we learn to cope with the world too familiar with a bend of our backs and too eager to see the way we drop belonging has only ever come when the night is over, when we're left in the corner of everyone's eyes, our dance outcast into spotlight, hitting Vogue and ninjutsu all in one pose chop, like we feel it in our bones, like this is me GTA 5 Millie, like it's about that time at Asgard to Ragnarok. And only O knows the way our steps fill up like when Bruce Banner's fed up. This is radioactive. So by the time we fall out to an IHOP, we are glowing. Mm. <laughs> Brought together by a night we had all calendared with dread. Our song, barbecue stained with cynicism mm. and regret, but the tune Still sweet, I hum it again and again. Hold close to the notes, trying my best to never forget. To never forget. Chelsea, can you read those scores out, please? From low to high, I have a 9.2, a 9.3, and a 9.3. Clap it up for the poet. So allow me to recap a couple of things you should know. Uh, my name is Joseph Green. Uh, if you want to know more about me, you can follow me online at Joseph LMS Green. I, I'm the CEO of an educational consulting company and motivational speaker and spoken word poet. I am the former director of youth programs at an amazing organization that co-sponsored this event. They're called Split This Rock. Yes, yeah, Split This Rock, right? You can find them online at splitthisrock.org. They do amazing programming for both adults and youth uh, throughout the nation. Right? They have an amazing presence here in the city, but they also have poetry and events that span the world, actually. Um, also, a big thanks to the Library of Congress for making space for this event. Yeah, let's wrap that up. Right now, if I could have all the young people, including the sacrificial poet that touched the stage, come back up to the stage real quick, I would appreciate it. Come up to the stage, y'all can clap for them as they come up to the stage. That's appropriate. That's very appropriate. Poetry saves lives. Literally, figuratively. Figuratively, we've all had that one day where that one thing pushed us too far to the edge and that one song, that one line, that one movie brought us back. Literally, there are classrooms, spaces filled with young people throughout this entire country working relentlessly on work, on, excuse me, on words, on craft, on creating poems. That act, that actual act, those after school programs are saving lives. If you believe that, because it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If you believe that, if you witness that here today, please support programs like Split This Rock. 
right? If you want to know more about them, they're right back there at that table. Now I would like to call to the stage the director of youth programs at Split This Rock, Chelsea Arellano. And Robert Casper! <laughs> they will be announcing the winners. Thank you, Joseph. So we are going to announce the top three poets, third, second, and first place. And the prizes that Rob has come up here to hand out are some books that are signed by the current uh, Poet Laureate. And um, Elizabeth Acevedo's book is Woo! part of that prize as well. So can I get a drum roll, please, as I announce the poet that came in third place is Mariama. And in second place, drum roll please, for Kofi. And in first place, the winner of this year's National Book Festival Youth Poetry Slam is Marjan. Uh, if y'all had a good time, I need y'all to make a whole lot of noise right now. <laughs> on behalf of the Library of Congress, on behalf of Split This Rock, on behalf of myself, thank you all for coming out. Have a good night, and come and talk to a poet on your way out. Meet somebody, shake a hand. <laughs>